Okay, so it's good to see everyone today. Our um, portion today is uh, one more person coming in. Just a second here. Our portion today, oh, <laughs> another person coming in. So just wait for them to, to get situated. Okay, so uh, it's good to see everyone. Uh, I mute it all, but feel free to unmute if you have a question or comment. Our portion is Tazria, which begins on page 649 in the Eitz Chaim, chapter 12 of Leviticus, whatever edition you're using. Baruch HaTadonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Shekitshanu B'mitzvotav Etzivanu La'asok B'divrei Torah. So, um, Tazria, this portion Tazria, is usually combined with next week's portion Mitzora, uh, in which uh, we learn about ver laws of purity as they relate to childbirth, but mostly to skin rashes, what's called leprosy and other uh, things that other wh when things f when uh, when there are flows from the body uh, what what flows from the body and what 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 elements make one impure uh, and then how to go about purifying oneself from that impurity so it's archaic uh nothing about the the only the only thing that still is maintained as purity laws today in jewish tradition and this is mainly in the orthodox world is for married women once a month uh until they reach menopause uh to go to the mikvah so um, that's the only element of ritual purity that's talked about in these two portions that is that still apply today because everything else requires the work of a Kohen. And uh, this is interesting. Oh, Paul. <laughs> Paul, you, you're still, you logged in as me instead of you. Um, so I, I was wondering why did I why did I see my picture come up on the screen? <laughs> yeah, Paul Paul can log in on me sometimes when I'm not available to lead Minion. He has my login to Zoom, so he forgot to uh, <laughs> to uh, to log in as himself. Um, so all issues of purity uh, had to be taken care of by a Kohen with a subsequent uh with a subsequent sacrifice or some kind of offering brought to first the mishkan later to the temple in jerusalem so that's why whereas women being married women uh to purify themselves once a month that is uh, done in a way that uh, the Kohen and any offering to the temple is not necessary um, and not part of that purification process. The only other purification that we may be familiar with is uh, when we uh, go to a cemetery and then leave. When we leave, going to the cemetery, contact with the dead, in any form, uh, and and even um, the uh, the the uh, inadvertent contact that walking through a cemetery is that it's not literally physical contact, but just being in the same space makes one ritually impure. Uh, that we learn about in in Numbers chapter nineteen, but. Uh, there, the, uh, we need an, an offering uh, and, a pro and a process to become ritually pure again. And the, the, uh, the washing of the hands 
after leaving a cemetery, some people uh, have a pitcher of water at the Shiva house. Uh, it, that's not necessary. Um, it's really at the cemetery, but some cemeteries don't have water available to wash hands. So that's why it's at the Shiva house instead. Um, that, that washing is just token, symbolic. It, uh, it, it has nothing to do with getting rid of the impurity from contact with the dead. Where the only way to become pure from that is to undergo the ceremony and process that's described in Numbers chapter 19. So uh, well, what I mean by all this introduction is that the, the relationship, the relevance of Tazria and Mitzorah, we'll talk about Mitzorah next week, uh, is uh, questionable today. That it's kind of hard to come up with the more global issues of purity and impurity uh, that we can learn from, uh, from these portions. Okay, now I, I will just point out since Gay Bieber is on, on the Zoom today, his daughter became bat mitzvah t- with, this, with these portions. And she was able to, uh, to write a very nice speech about these issues in a way that would make sense uh, in our world today. So there, there are ways to, to treat this homiletically, you know, how to deal with people who um, are different from other people. How, how do we, uh, you know, so the issue is that when we contact or contract this skin ailment, the skin rash that is, dis- that is translated here as leprosy, but is not the Hansen's disease, but because it's clearly something that, uh, that is curable. Uh, once someone contracts that and a Kohen inspects it and declares that this person has this particular skin rash, then a person has to be set aside from the community, has to leave the community and go someplace else until the rash goes away. So that is that that whole idea of how we treat people who are different, um, how we can still maintain them as part of the community, how uh, the holiest of people in the community, the Kohen, still has contact with everyone in the community, no matter their status as pure and impure, so that there are lessons there that we can learn from this. Okay, so um, with that introduction uh, to what the skin rash is and the process of the Kohen to inspect, uh, what not. Also, uh, the other thing is Tazri and Mitzara uh, are separated usually when it's a leap year, and, and this uh, 5784 is a leap year. So that means that there are four extra weeks added to the calendar, which means four extra Torah portions that have to be read, um, it, it, that, that four extra Shabbatot that need a Torah portion. So if you, if you, we just read all the portions uh, as, and those portions that are usually combined as combined, that we wouldn't have enough Torah portions. So that's why we undivide those that are usually go together. Um, so that also, the Haftarah for Tazria hasn't been recited. Uh, this was a question that was on Ravnet just this morning. When was the last time that we did the Haftarah just for Tazria uh, in synagogue? And the last time was 21 years ago. So sometime, because we're close to Passover, the way the calendar falls out, sometimes this would be a special Haftarah. Like last week was Shabbat HaChodesh, always the Shabbat right before the month of Nisan begins is HaChodesh. So it all depends on when the new moon falls out that perhaps when Tazri and Mitzorah were separated in another year since 5763, it was one of these special Shabbatot. So this, it's not a special Shabbos this week. Next week for Mitzorah, we don't do the Haftarah for Mitzorah because next week is the Shabbat immediately preceding Passover. We have the special Haftarah for Shabbat Hagadol. So, uh, so, 
perhaps Tazria in other years, what if it was separated was the Shabbat immediately pre preceding Passover, and therefore it was Shabbat Hagadol and not the Haftarah. So we have that extra week in the calendar without a it between the beginning of Nisan and Passover. So that's why we have the Haftarah for Tazria today. And I want to look at the Haftarah uh, and the story that uh, is told here about the prophet Elisha and a leper that he uh, confronts and um, interacts with and, and just compare and contrast what the Torah teaches about how to be, uh, how to treat leprosy uh, in the Torah portion versus how the prophet Elisha is treating it here. So let's turn to the Haftarah, which is on page 672. 672. And whatever Chumash you're using, you want to find the Haftarah for Tazria. Not the Haftarah for Tazria Mitzora, not the Haftarah for Mitzora, the one for Tazria, which is two kings beginning with chapter, the end of chapter 4, and then chapter 5. And we're going to look at chapter 5. So as you're finding the page, we're going to be on 673. Just a little bit of background here. So Elisha is, is a prophet who takes over for Elijah. We know about the prophet Elijah. We sing to him at the Passover Seder. We sing to him at Havdalah every Saturday night. We have a chair set aside for him at every bris. So uh, why? Why do we have that? Because Elijah the prophet, who was mainly in, so the book of Kings, there are two books of Kings, so he's mainly in one Kings. Um, Elijah the prophet, it, uh, the famous story about Elijah the prophet, which is the Haftarah for Kitisa, is um, the um, competition that he sets up on Mount Carmel which is today where Haifa is uh, in Israel, uh, he sets a competition between Baal and God, and 400 Baal priests uh, set up a sacrifice on Mount Carmel. They whip themselves into a frenzy and ask the Baal priest, the ba uh, Baal God, Baal, to consume the sacrifice to no avail. Elijah sets up his sacrifice to God, uh, douse, uh, drowns it in water, prays to God, and God immediately consumes the sacrifice in a ball of fire. So that's the story of Elijah. Elijah is first of the prophets to perform miracles like this. Um, Elisha, uh, oh, and why do we uh, pray to Elijah? and? Uh, Elijah is supposed to be the prophet who will accompany the Messiah into Jerusalem when the when it's time for the temple to be rebuilt and the um, messianic era, the, a descendant of King David, will uh, reassume the throne of the uh, kingdom of Israel. So Elijah will escort the Messiah, the anointed one, who is descended from King David, okay? The prophet Isaiah talks about it. Uh, other places in the Bible talk about what the Messianic era is. So Elijah is that prophet. So why? Because Elijah did not die. Elijah, in, at the end of 1 Kings, is described as ascending to heaven in a fiery chariot, All right? So it doesn't say he died. And then uh, Elisha took over. It's uh, Elisha and Elijah were walking, and Elijah gives Elisha his mantle, whatever that is. Is it like a talus? Is it like some kind of uh, cloak? We don't know. It, El Elijah gives Elisha his, his mantle, and then this fiery chariot uh, takes uh, Elijah up to heaven. So because he didn't die, uh, that's why the, the assumption for the rabbis is he's still alive, and that, uh, you know, the, uh, there's a phrase in the, um, there's a phrase in the, in the Talmud 
that whenever the rabbis can't decide, uh, solve a halachic dispute, they say teku. Teku is an abbreviation for tishbi. Elijah is Eliyahu ha tishbi. Eliyahu, Eliyahu. Eli Elijah's a tishbite. Tishbi yav, uh, yitaretz kushyot ubibayot. So letter tough, tishbi. Yitaretz, the letter yud. Kushyot, uh, questions, the letter kuf. V, the letter vav, so teku. That becomes teku. In a modern Hebrew, that's a tie. You know, soccer matches end in teku, if it's, if it's a scoreless tie. Uh, or if, if it's just a tie, nobody wins. So it, it, it's used in modern Hebrew today, but it's from the Gemara uh, about Elijah coming. And, and there are stories about rabbis meeting Elijah. I always share one before Neila starts uh, about uh, Rabbi Joshua ben Levi going out to where uh, the lepers are, actually to find Elijah. When will you come? When the gates are closing. Okay, so that's the, the story uh, that I always share to introduce Neila. Anyway, so there are lots of stories about Elijah in rabbinic literature. Uh, and so his student is Elisha. And Elisha takes over and performs even more miracles than Elijah does. Some crazy miracles, uh, like uh, the, the first thing that Elisha does, which uh, after Elijah uh, ascends to heaven, as he's walking to the town of Beth Beit El, uh, children come out and start yelling at him, essentially saying, hey, Baldy, hey, Baldy, and making fun of him. Literally, that's what the Bible says. They call him, the, the children are yelling, hey, Baldy, hey, Baldy. And uh, Alicia, unlike me, I don't care about being bald. Alicia did care about it. And he invokes God to kill those children. So bears come out of the woods and, um, t and bears uh, slaughter 42 children. That's the first thing that Elisha does after Elijah goes into heaven. But uh, he tempers his, uh, his wrath uh, from then on. And we, we, have a, we have a famous story of Elisha. That's the Haftarah for the portion Vayera back in Genesis with a poor woman who only has a jug of oil and she owes a lot of money. Elisha tells her to uh, collect all these pots and pans and vessels from neighbors and start pouring the oil. She starts pouring and is able from a little jug of oil to fill up all the vessels around. She's able to sell all the oil and pay off her debts. The other one is uh, a woman, a uh, barren woman. Uh, Elisha tells her in a year's time, you'll have a, a, a baby. Uh, the baby grows up and uh, collapses in the field. The woman calls for Elisha to come. Elisha comes, looks like uh, from what the Torah, Bible describes as CPR, and uh, the, the, this collapsed uh, boy comes back to life. Uh, what did he die? Or did he faint? It seems like he's out for a long time, so probably he died, and Elisha brings him back to life. So that's the Haftarah for the portion of Vayera. Here he does another miracle. So for those 20 minutes now of an introduction to understand something about this unusual status of Elijah and Elisha performing miracles that no other prophets do, and if we're familiar with the Christian Bible, uh, the stories of Elijah and Elisha serve as a um, precedent for the supposed uh, miracles that Jesus performs. Right? Jesus brings somebody to life. Jesus uh, feeds people. Well, that's that's the the little bit on six seventy two, which we're not going to look at, is one loaf of bread feeding a hundred people. So Jesus does that too, but with a lot more people and bread and fish. Right. So very, very similar stories. And also the fact that uh, Jesus in the in the Gospels is said to be descended from King David, all to point out then 
that Jesus rightly is the Messiah. Okay, so uh, the Elijah and Elisha stories of miracles uh, serve an important purpose. Uh, it's unusual for us in Jewish tradition to uh, to understand because we're we're not we're not used to over the ages of rabbis or anybody in the community performing miracles. There are stories in the Talmud of rabbis performing miracles, but you know it's understood as just you know this didn't happen and the point of the story in the in the talmud is to teach a lesson whereas it, it, when you're reading the bible the tendency is to think that it really happened i i and the way i read the bible i don't think that that way i think it's meant here to teach a lesson and we have different models of prophets and the way that they teach people through their actions and uh, by their words okay so let's look at page 673 and get to the, haft, the Haftarah that relates to the Torah portion about leprosy. Um, so this is chapter 5 of 2 Kings. V'na'aman sar tseva melech aram. This is just out of context. It starts and. And na'aman. So that in the English translation, the and isn't there. But in the Hebrew, the and is there. But it's out of context. We, we haven't met na'aman before. Because before, as these three sentences here of the end of chapter 4 just talk about this miracle of the bread. So, V'na'aman sar tseva melech aram, haya ish gadol lifnei Adonav, unesu fanim, kivo natan Adonai teshua la'aram, v'ha ish haya gibor chayil metzora. Okay, so Na'aman is the uh, captain of the army of the king of Aram. It says here, commander, commander, captain. Uh, he was a great man or an important man before his lord, that is the king, and Nesu Fanim. So his face was elevated. In other words, he had elevated status, high in his favor, it says, okay? Because God had given salvation or victory to Aram. In other words, Aram, what is Syria today, is in the process of attacking and conquering the northern kingdom of Israel. Okay, so we're, we're talking about the mid-800s BCE. So and this is what the time frame here. And so Aram is in the process of creeping into the northern kingdom of Israel until such time, about 50 years uh, after this, that they'll finally defeat the northern kingdom and exile 10 of the 12 tribes to Assyria to never be seen again. Okay, so uh, the, from the Bible's perspective, uh, the enemies of Israel and Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel, uh, the Assyrians and the Babylonians are, are tools of God uh, acting in this way, allowed to be victorious uh, because of Israel, northern kingdom and southern kingdom, uh, uh, neglecting the covenant, uh, worshiping idols, and even bringing idolatry into the temple in Jerusalem. So from the Bible's perspective, uh, Aram, Assyria, and Babylonia are victorious because God wants them to be victorious to um, punish the people of Israel. Okay, that's the Bible's perspective. Okay, so that's that's a religious perspective on historical events, right? Which is why ultra-Orthodox people think the Holocaust came and happened to uh, as punishment for the extremely secular Jews of Germany. It is a it is uh, an awful. Um, uh, a, a, an awful understanding of uh, and perspective of history, but again, uh, based on the Bible, if that that uh, and the and the destruction of the Second Temple in Jerusalem too is understood as uh, punishment. Why would God allow God's house to be destroyed? Because the people of Israel had uh, neglected God. So terrible things happen to Jews 
according to this traditional perspective, because how terrible Jews have acted. Okay, so to the extreme, the Holocaust, okay. Again, this is a traditional perspective. It's not a, a non-traditional modern Jewish perspective. Okay, so, but that's just why Aram was allowed to be victorious by God. And the person, Naaman, was a, uh, a warrior and he was a leper. Okay, so Naaman sounds like a Jewish name. And in fact, it, it is a modern, uh, it's like the name Naomi. And the, the, the girl's equivalent of Naaman would be Naomi. It is a, an Israeli name today, but this is an Aramean name. And Aramean and Hebrew are similar languages, like Arabic and Hebrew. Um, Naaman, so he's an Aramean commander of the army, and he's a leper. Okay. Two. The Aram yatsu gedudim vayishbu me eretz Yisrael na'arak tana vatehi lifnei eshet Naaman. So Aram uh, were out raiding, and they uh, took captive uh, from the land of Israel a, a young girl, Na'arakitana, unclear, really unclear how old, how, how to define the age category of a Na'ar or a Na'ara. Okay, Rebecca, when uh, Eliezer met her, to bring her back to marry Isaac. She's called a Na'ara. So, but for them, the rabbis say she was three years old, which doesn't make sense, but chronologically, that's how they understand her age in the story. But Na'ara could be just, I would say, young, under 21, but a teenager in, just because of what happens next in the story, you don't expect a three-year-old to be able to talk and to make a suggestion that she's about to do. So it's a, it's a teenager, or a young woman, and she served, she was taken captive, so she served um, the wife of Naaman. Okay, so, three. Vatomer el givirta, achale adoni lifne hanavi, asher b'shomron. So the uh, she she this this is Israelite um, maiden who is taken captive says to her boss her mistress um, my, uh, my lord should um, should go before like pray before beseech uh, the prophet who is in Shomron, that is Elisha. He should beseech Elisha because Elisha can cure him from his, from his tsara'at, from his leprosy. Okay, so Naaman's a leper. He's the enemy. He represents the enemy. The captive woman, young woman, says to her boss, we don't know anything about their interaction. The only thing she says, and she's here in this story, only to tell us why Naaman is going to see Elisha. She says to, she doesn't say it to Naaman, she says it to her, to the mistress. You should tell him to go to Elisha to be cured from his leprosy. Now, the interesting thing is, before we go on with the story, is that's not what the Torah says to do. The Torah doesn't tell us to go see a prophet in order to be cured from leprosy. In fact, the Torah doesn't know from prophets. Uh, not, not, not quite. Um, in, in the book of Numbers, Joshua tells Moses, you know, there are two people prophesying in the camp. Eldad and Medad, and Moses doesn't care. So uh, there is this, and Moses himself was a prophet. Okay, so there is, somehow there's prophecy in the Torah, okay? But the role of the prophet was, was given to Moses 
and, and to Joshua. There are no other prophets around. At this time in the Bible, there are schools of prophets. That is, you can go to school to become a prophet. It's kind of like, just imagine law school or medical school, there's prophet school. You, want to, you have this sense of uh, spirituality about you, go to prophet school. And, and the Bible does make reference to them. We only know about the, the more famous of them who have books in the Bible named after them. But there were plenty of other prophets around who don't have their own book, who are still mentioned within the books of the Bible, like the prophet Nathan, who was the prophet at the time of King David. So in, one, in, the, in the books of Samuel, Nathan is mentioned. He doesn't have his own book, but he's a prophet. And there are other prophets like that. Jonah is mentioned in Kings, but he also has his own book. So, um, uh, so the fact that this captive Israelite woman says to her mistress, that he should he the boss the the master should go to elisha to be cured says something about the notoriety of elisha and before him elijah and what they were able to accomplish on behalf of the israelite community at that time so in other words that there's a temple in jerusalem that you would think people would go to if they have problems but people aren't doing it or at least there are no stories left in the Bible in which people are going to the temple in Jerusalem in order to have their problems solved. What we do have is prophets roaming the land, solving problems for people as they come, as they meet, as they see them. So somehow the temple no longer is seen as a place for. Uh, for uh, religion uh, in this way, like um, uh, where petitionary prayers are answered. And uh, the Kohen isn't the person that people are going to, right? There are, there's no story of, in the Bible, of Kohanim doing anything like, um, like the Torah says they should be doing. Now, the Haftarah on the first day of Rosh Hashanah is about Chana going to the Mishkan in the city of Shiloh to pray for a child and to be loved again by Elkanah. And we have the priest Eli who uh, argues with her, what are you doing just moving your lips like that? Nobody is supposed to come here drunk. Right, so that's in the story, and then she prays, she convinces Ailey she's not drunk, and she's praying, and then Ailey says, your prayer is going to be answered. It's the only time we have a Kohen actually, actually answering the needs of a woman. Every, here, in this part of the Bible, it's the prophets doing it. So the point is that it's, it's even a captive woman a captive Israelite woman knows that it's the prophet who's going to solve your problem, not the Kohen who's going to solve your problem. And, and the Elisha will not only solve the problems of Israelites, he'll solve the problems of the arch enemy, the Arameans. Right? She suggests that the commander of the Aramean forces who are attacking Israel, go to the prophet to be cured of leprosy. So I'm just, so it just raises questions. What's the role of the prophet? What, why is the prophet, why does this captive woman think that the prophet's going to help the enemy? And why does she think that the prophet is, can cure leprosy? We don't have a story about him curing a leper before. We have stories of the magic of the, what seemingly is the magic of this, uh, the jug of oil. We have the bread that, that feeds 100 people. We have the prophet who's, who brings this boy back to life. 
So, okay, so maybe he can cure leprosy too. Okay, four. Vayavo vayaged la Adonav lemor, kazot vechazot dibra hanara, asher me eretz Yisrael. Vayavo. Uh, okay, so, um, so he, he went and told his master, saying, such and such, the, this, this girl said, who's from the land of Israel. Now, it's, uh, and because of verse 5, that's why Naaman is in brackets at the start of verse 4. You would think it should be Vatavo, that is, the Naaman's wife came and told her it should be La Adoneha. So the fact that it's Vayavo, he came, La Adonav, his master, as opposed to what should be from the next sentence, it should be Vatavo, Vataged, La Adoneha. So she should have come, his wife, to him and telling him, this is what the girl said. But there's, that step is missing. So he's told, and now he wants to go to see the prophet, but he needs permission from his boss, the king of Aram. So this is what he tells the king of Aram. And five, verse five, Vayomer melech Aram, lech bo, ve'eshlecha sefer el melech Yisrael, vayelech vayikach biyado eser kikarei chesef, ve'sheshet alafim zahav, ve'eser chalifot begadim. So the king of Aram says, Lech bo, uh, that is, go come. It's, it's an unusual phrasing, that is, go. But lech bo, that is, go and go to. And I'll send a scroll to the king of Israel. I'll use you as a messenger. I'll let you go and see Elisha, but on the way, stop and see the king of Israel, I'll have a message for you. And he went and he took in his hand 10 talents of silver, 6,000 gold pieces, and 10 garments, 10 changes of clothes, 10, like 10 suits. Vayave hasefer el melech Yisrael, lemor vata kivo hasefer hazeh elecha, and he, he brought the scroll to the king of Israel, saying, Now, with the arrival of the, this scroll to you, I have that I have sent, I have sent to you Naaman, my servant, cure him from his leprosy. So, in other words, that's the scroll. In other words, he's, he's bringing like a permission slip from the king of Aram to allow him to go to Israel to ask the king of Israel to cure him of his leprosy. Okay? Seven, Vayahi kikro melech Yisrael ata sefer vayikra begadav vayomer ha'elohim ani lahamitu lahachayot ki ze sholeach elai laesof ish mitzarato Ki ach deuna uru ki mit anehu li. So the king of Israel says, when he read uh, the this scroll, he ripped his garment and said, "Am I God that I can kill and bring back to life? That is, cure leprosy." In other words, we have to understand if if you have leprosy. It's almost like a death sentence. Even though the Torah says you can be cured of it, uh, no. Even though you, you can't be cured of it, somehow the rash can go away. Um, the, um, oftentimes it doesn't go away. And the death sentence is you're not part of the community. You're, you're living in limbo. You're not allowed into the community. You're not allowed to go anywhere else. You have to stay within your own community of other people who have the same skin rash. So it's as if you have a death sentence. So the king said, so the, the king of Aram says in this scroll, cure this man of leprosy. And the king of Israel says, I can't do this. Am I God? So in other words, he's saying, he's sending to me 
to cure a man from his uh, leprosy uh, now know for sure that he's, as it's translated here, seeking a pretext against me. In other words, if I don't cure him, which I can't do, and he knows I can't do, maybe he's going to attack. So why does he send me this letter? It must be because he's intending to attack. And he, you know, if I can, if I can somehow miraculously cure this man, maybe he won't attack. That's how the king of Israel understands this message. Eight. Vayehi ki shmoa elisha isha Elohim, ki kara melech Yisrael et begadav, vayishlach el hamelech lemor, lama karata begadecha, yavona elai veyeda ki yeshnavi bi Yisrael. So when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel ripped his garment, he sent a message to the king. Why did you rend your garment? Uh, let him come to me, and he'll learn that there is a prophet in Israel. That is, send this Naaman to me, and he'll know that there's a prophet in Israel. Vayavo, so then the king does uh, send Naaman there. Vayavo Naaman besusav uvivrichbo. Vayamod petachabayit le Elisha. So Naaman came with his horse and chariot, horses and chariots, horses and chariot, and he was standing outside of uh, Elisha's home. Vayishlach elav Elisha malach lemor. Haloch ve rachatsta sheva pa'amim be yardain ve yashov besarchalacha utahar. Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, so he doesn't meet him in person. Naaman, the commander of the Aramean forces, is standing outside his house. And Elisha sends a messenger to tell Naaman, go and bathe seven times in the Jordan River, and your flesh will return to you, and you will be pure. Okay, so why couldn't Elisha tell him this directly? And why does Naaman accept a messenger telling him this, and not Elisha directly? Another interesting thing to think about. But Elisha simply tells him, without even looking at him. Well, maybe he's looking at him from a window in his house to see, but he just says his message, go to the Jordan River, bathe seven times, and you'll be cured. 11. Vayiktsof Naaman vayelach vayomer, hine amarti elai yetse yatso vaamad vikara b'shem Adonai Elohav vehenif yado el hamakom vaasaf hametzora. Um, Naaman was angered, and he went away, and he said, I thought, he said, he would surely come out to me, and would stand and invoke the Lord his God by name, and would wave his hand toward the spot and cure the affected part. I thought Elisha would come out and put his hand on me, or above me, do some magic abracadabra, and I'd be cured. Abracadabra, by the way, is Aramaic. So he could have said abracadabra. <laughs> but that's what Naaman thought. How dare he send this messenger and tell me to bathe in the Jordan River? I expected him to come to me directly and do something directly to my body. 12. Halo tov amana ufarpar naharot damesek mikol meme Yisrael. Halo erchatz bahem v'taharti vayifen vayelech bechema. And he, and, and he continued and said, aren't the rivers of Damascus, Amana and Parpar, don't know what those rivers are, but the rivers of Damascus, aren't those rivers better than all the rivers of Israel? May, I should go in and bathe in them and be pure. And he went away, he turned and went away in anger. 
right? How dare Alicia tell me to bathe in this piddly river, the Jordan River, right? Anybody who's been to Israel and seen the Jordan River knows that it's barely a river. It's mostly a stream. And he's telling me, he's telling me by way of a messenger to bathe in the Jordan River. He doesn't even come out to meet me and to pray over me or do something with, my, with his hands. He's telling me that the Jordan River is going to cure me. Aren't the rivers of Damascus better than the river of Israel? 13. So his servants came to him and said to him, my father, okay, it's translated here as sir, but the word is uh, avi, my father. That's the, his servants are, call, are, are addressing him as my father, not Adoni, my lord, but avi, my father. It's translated here as sir. So it's just we're missing that in the translate. My father, a great thing, a, a, a great word or a great thing, the prophet spoke to you. Shouldn't you do it? Uh, and, he, and he said to you to, to wash and you'd be pure. Uh, so why wouldn't you do it? In other words, the, the, these servants dare to speak to their master when he's angry to tell him, the servants tell him, you should listen to the prophet. Now, the captive Israelite woman is the one who said to Naaman's wife to go to see the prophet. And now these servants, another form of captivity, that you could say they're slaves. His slaves, that's the same word. Um, his, uh, probably his slaves said to him, so how dare the captive woman say anything to Naaman's wife? How dare these slaves say anything to Naaman, especially when he's angry? Okay, so the role of the slave captive it's interesting in this story. 14. So it doesn't, Naaman doesn't like kill these slaves. How dare you talk to me? Instead, 14, Vayered, Vayid Bol Bayardain, Sheva Pamim, Kidvar Isha Elohim, Vayashav Besaro, Kivasar Naar Katon, Vayit Har. So he went, he went down and bathed in the Jordan seven times, like the man of God said and his flesh returned like the flesh of a, of a young child, and he was pure. And Na'ar Katon is the, male, the masculine equivalent of Na'ara Ketana back, back in verse 2. So, the, uh, is it the same age? The, I, so he has the skin, the skin, uh, we don't know how old Naaman is, he is the top commander of the army, so you have to be a little bit old uh, to, uh, to, to have that kind of position, but he has the flesh again of a young lad, so a teenage boy, okay? Smooth skin. Um, 15. Vayashav el ish Elohim, hu v'cho machanehu, vayavo vayamod lafana vayomer, so, um, he returned to the man of God, he and his whole camp, he came and stood before him and said, now I know that there is no other God in all the land except in Israel. That is, the God of Israel is the one and only God. And now take this blessing, that's literally, but this gift from your servant. So accept a gift from your servant. It's a bless, a, a, it's a bracha, in, in, in usually is translated as blessing, but here it's a gift. 
um, take this gift from your... So he's angry that he didn't meet Elisha in person. Now he's meeting him in person, and he's giving him a gift and declaring that the God of Israel is the God because he was cured so easily in the Jordan River. 16, Vayomer, Chai Adonai Asher Amadati Lefanav Imekach Vayivtsarbo Lakachat Vayemaen. And he said, that as Elisha said, uh, by the life of God, as God lives, who I stand before him, in other words, I, God forbid, God forbid I should take, and he, so he, he refused from taking the gift, okay? He pressed him to accept, he, oh, Naaman wanted him to accept the gift, and he refused, and Elisha said, so God forbid I should take a gift, that's what Elisha does, so all these stories, he doesn't take a gift, he, he just does these miracles, and he takes no gift, uh, in return, no thanks or anything uh, besides words of thanks. No thank gift. No thank uh, uh, gratitude gifts. Seventeen. Vayomer Naaman, valo yutan na laavdecha masa semed pradim adama kilo yase od avdecha ola vezevach leloim achirim ki im la Adonai. And Naaman said, then at least. Let your servant be given two mule loads of earth, for your servant will never again offer up burnt offering or sacrifice to any god except the Lord. Like he, wants, he wants earth from the land of Israel to build an altar because he doesn't want to offer an altar to any other god than the god of Israel. 18. La davar hazeh yislach Adonai la'avdecha and he wants to be forgiven for accompanying his master. Naaman wants to be forgiven from accompanying his master, that is the king of Aram, to Beit Rimon to worship there. Like he has to go through the formalities if he wants to remain general of, of Aram's army. He has to go with the king to Beit Rimon to, to offer sacrifices there. So please, Elisha, ask God to forgive me from doing that. I don't believe in that anymore. I'm just going through the motions. 19. Vayomer lo lech l'shalom vayelech mi'ito kivrat aretz. So Elisha said to him, go in peace. In other words, yeah, what you want is, is given to you. Lech shalom, go in peace. And he went a great distance. So our time is nearly up. It's just a fascinating story. A, fa a lot can be done literarily with this story. Like I said, and I'm not much of a literary person myself to understand these things, but the, but the role of slave and captive woman in the story, how central they are to get people to do things, that you need the captive or the slave to, to make things happen in the story. The idea that the, the, the general of the Aramean army would convert to Judaism or convert to Israelite religion, and that would accept the God of Israel as the God of all gods, and uh, that Elisha, Elisha doesn't care about um, uh, pride of being an Israelite. In other words, he's not, Elisha does whatever God tells him to do. That's, I think, what the story is, that you would think somebody who is an Israelite would not deign to have any conversation with an Aramean, let alone the general of the Aramean army. They would think that they're, they're coming to attack. And that you would think then an Israelite would stay far away from this Aramean. But the fact that Elisha uh, not only has contact with him, but provides a cure for his ailment, it gets to the bigger point of the Bible here that uh, God works the way God wants to work. And um, God rises above uh, the basic 
uh, ways in which uh, human beings relate with one another, especially in a time of war. So that here, Elisha, with this miracle performed on Naaman, is a, a, an individual example of the bigger message that God uses the um, Arameans or the enemy for a tool to teach Israel a lesson. So it's like in the story of Jonah that we read on Yom Kippur, there the, the king in Nineveh uh, repents also, right? Why? Why the arch enemy of, of Israel, the Assyrians there in Nineveh, uh, why are they allowed to repent? Uh, again, teaching the bigger message about God and, and God's role in the universe and that we can't understand these things except that God can work in, in mysterious ways. Just like leprosy itself, the skin rash is, is mysterious. And we, just, we just have to pray to God, do the ritual that's in the Torah, or pray to God, uh, or go to the prophet, or pray to God today, and put our trust, put our trust in God. Any questions or comments before we conclude? So that's the, the fascinating story of uh, Elisha and Naaman. And I uh, hope everybody has a good rest of the day. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye.